were Old Testament saints saved by looking forward to the cross. That's what we're going to talk about this week. I've been making references to that, that that's not true, that teaching. And I'm going to show you from the King James Bible this week that that teaching comes from non-dispensationalists that do not understand the Word of God. They disobey the clear command in Scripture, 2 Timothy 2.15. They disobey that clear command to study and to rightly divide. They don't do that. They just want to say everything in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation belongs to us as Christians today. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. And they know that themselves. They're just not honest enough to admit it. You say, what are you talking about? Well, if you say salvation has always been the same, anybody, a two-year-old, you know, that understands anything could come along and say, but Jesus wasn't in the Old Testament. So how could they have been saved in the Old Testament the same way that they, we get saved today because Jesus Christ wasn't in the Old Testament? That's a problem. And so these people, they came out and they said, well, we'll come out with this teaching and we'll repeat the lie often enough so it becomes truth, you know, <laughs> at least in their warped little congregations. And they come out and they say, well, you see, Jesus wasn't in the Old Testament, but the cross was. They understood salvation by grace through faith and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So they were looking forward to the cross. So they got saved by looking forward to the cross. And they just keep saying we were, they were saved by looking forward to the cross. You see, friend, they were saved by looking forward to the cross. Looking forward, looking forward, looking forward, looking forward. And everybody started to Oh, uh, yeah, okay, they were saved by looking forward to the cross. But what does the Bible say? See, see, they don't study. The people in the non-dispensational movement are parrots. That's all they do. They parrot the lies of those that are preaching to them. Because usually the non-dispensationalists, at least the ones I've ever run into, are usually very charismatic in their delivery. They preach the Word of God with conviction and they tell it like it is and we don't compromise the Word. See, like that? And you'll hear these guys, watch any of these, these big mouth Baptists, you know, and stuff because they're the ones that are mostly doing this. You watch them and they'll be up there spewing heresy from the pulpit and the guys down in the congregation, if the guy's yelling and putting on a good enough show, they're down there going, Amen, Amen, preach it, oh, Amen. You know? And this is one of the lies that these people have put out. Now, we're going to start out in the study. And uh, we're going to start out in Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to show you that there are, you know, one of the ways that these people will prove this is they'll say that there are prophecies that point to the sacrifice of Calvary. Therefore, uh, that's why they were saved by looking forward to the cross because they saw the prophecies, they understood the prophecies, and that's what they put their faith in. And so that's what led to their salvation eventually. And so we're going to look at these Old Testament prophecies that show, that, that are saying what's going to happen in the future. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 through 19. It says here, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, two great lights, excuse me, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Hmm. Interesting, because in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it talks about one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So, on the fourth day, the sun shows up. Hmm. Four thousand years approximately after the creation of the world, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, shows up. So now the non-dispensationalists get all excited and they say, see, looking forward to the cross. We're going to see about that. Look at verse 20. And God said, let, there be, let the waters bring forth abundantly, and the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly upon the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So life shows up after the sun shows up. Very interesting. And of course, I'm not trying to debunk these as prophecies. They are prophecies of Jesus Christ showing up, certainly. 
but they, the people were not saved by putting their faith in these prophecies. And we're going to see that as we get through the study. Next, go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. It says here, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay? Another prophecy about Jesus Christ. You say, what's the prophecy? Well, the coming Savior would be from the seed of the woman. He wouldn't get his seed from a normal fleshly man. Okay? It would be God that would come upon Mary and that she would become with a child of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Uh, so it's God manifest in the flesh. The Jewish Messiah, the Jewish Savior, is not a man that lives a very good life and is a good person and stuff like this. No, no. Only God could be the Savior of the world, could be the Savior of the Jewish people. Okay? So another prophecy there. Next, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Okay, it says here, And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. Now, it doesn't say what those animals were, but, you know, there's a lot of people that think it probably was a sheep, a lamb, there that was slain so that they could have, be clothed. Interesting. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross so that we could be clothed in his righteousness. His blood had to be spilled so that we could wear his righteousness. Hmm. Another little prophecy there of the future coming Savior. And look at verse 22, Genesis 3, 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good, good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Hmm. So, there's eternal life that can come from a tree. And, of course, you have the, the fulfillment of that in Revelation chapter 22. The tree of life shows up again there. Uh, the people that get saved in the millennial kingdom, I believe, have to eat of the tree of life to have eternal life. Why? It's a different dispensation. Okay? They're not saved by faith either in the millennial kingdom. Why? Because faith is the evidence of things not seen. Jesus Christ is physically present on the earth. How can you have faith in Jesus Christ when he's right over in Jerusalem? for the millennial kingdom. But uh, different study. But the point is there, eternal life comes from a tree. Hmm, interesting. Because the Bible says, I have it written out here, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Another interesting little tie in there, Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, speaking about eternal life and a tree. Kind of prophesying what Jesus Christ did. Next, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. It says here, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So you see there, God had respect to one type of sacrifice. He said, what was it? A lamb. Sheep there. A lamb was slain. Hmm. Another prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. That would happen in the future. Next go to Genesis chapter 9. And there are many, many, many of these prophecies. We're not going to look at all of them in the Old Testament that prophesy the coming of Jesus Christ. But um, we're just going to look at a couple of these. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 26. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So another prophecy that Noah gives there, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. He's telling you what family the Savior is going to be born from. The Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. Okay, next we're going to go to Exodus 12. 
Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 through 7. Exodus 12, verse 3 says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year. Hmm. Jesus Christ is a was the Lamb of God that was slain. He was without blemish. He never sinned. Never did any kind of sin. So he was without blemish. The only man that's ever been able to do that. And he's a male of the first year. I thought that was kind of interesting too there. What is Jesus? Well, our calendars are all dated by the birth of Jesus Christ. You know, they it's a... When he was born, they started the A.D. You have B.C., there before Christ, and then A.D., Anno Domini. You know, you have that that comes after that. Unless you're like a modern person and they say before the Common Era. You know, the B.C.E. and then the C.E. after that now. Common Era. You know, they get rid of Jesus Christ, in other words. But they still have to date their time like that. Interesting. Jesus was the male of the first year there. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it until up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house, wherein they shall eat it. Speaking of the Passover lamb, now notice the interesting thing there in um, verse 7. They take that blood of that lamb that was slain and they put it on this side of the door and they put it on that side of the door and above it. So what do you have? Left side, right side, and up here. You have the cross. Hmm. Well then, bless God, they were saved by looking forward to the cross. Not on your life. No, they were saved by killing that lamb and putting the blood on their doorposts. Okay? That's not the salvation that we have today. All right, Totally different thing. And of course, you had this thing. It was They were being saved in this passage from the death angel that came and killed the firstborn males of all the different families. All right, So it wasn't eternal salvation. It was salvation from the death angel killing your firstborn son. So again, to say, well, see, that's, that, that was the salvation there that they were looking forward to Jesus dying on the cross. That's nonsense. Okay, it was a prophecy in type. It showed the death that Jesus Christ would die someday. But it wasn't salvation. Like we have today, I should say. And you say, well, again, what's the significance there? Another one, let me just read this quick. John chapter 10, verse 7, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Hmm. That's very interesting, very telling. So again, you see the thing there of blood being ap applied to the doorposts, the blood of a lamb. Next, go to Exodus chapter 29. Exodus 29, verse 14. It says here, But the flesh of the bullock and his skin and his dung shalt thou burn with fire without the camp. It is a sin offering. So you see an offering being made there for sin, and it's being burned without the camp. Hmm. That's interesting. Luke 23, verse 33 says, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the mal malefactors, on one on the right hand and the other on the left. Again, you see right and left. Very interesting. But uh, turning your Bible to Hebrews chapter 13. We'll come back here to the Old Testament in a couple minutes. But I just want to show you this thing, the significance of this thing of being sacrificed without the camp, which is where Calvary was, by the way. Calvary was not in the city of Jerusalem. It was outside of it. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 11 
Okay, it says here, For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he, is might, or that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Um, I find that interesting because if you are a Hebrew, the book's written to you here, this book of Hebrews. If you're a Hebrew and you get saved, you put your faith in Jesus Christ today, or especially in the time of Jacob's trouble, are you going to be bearing the reproach of Jesus Christ? Oh, yes. <laughs> very much so. You're not going to be very popular. And of course, if you're a Gentile, uh, also, if you get saved, you are also going to be bearing the reproach of Jesus Christ. You're not going to get away from that. Uh, you're not going to be a friend of the world. You know, the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 4, that the friend of the world is the enemy of God. So, it's just not going to work out for you. Okay, You're going to have to go without the camp and bear the reproach of Jesus Christ if you want to be saved. Psalm 22, back to the Old Testament. Psalm 22, 22 verses 6 through 8. It says here, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. And they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. That's exactly what Jesus Christ went through. Remember, he's without the camp. He's outside of the gate there. And he, they're reproaching him. They're laughing at him. They're mocking him. See, again, another prophecy of Jesus Christ here in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ fulfilled these Old Testament prophecies. But the people back then didn't know that. They didn't understand these prophecies. Okay? And we're going to see that a little bit later on. Next look at uh, verse 13. Same psalm here. They ga gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Describing somebody who's dying, being crucified on the cross. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. Hmm. I may tell of tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Uh, but be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. So you see there are prophecies about Jesus Christ. I mean look at verse sixteen. They pierced my hands and my feet. That's exactly what happened to Jesus Christ. Okay, He is the Messiah to the Jewish people and the Savior of the world. All right, But is this clear enough to say that this is how you get saved in the Old Testament? No. This is not the plan of salvation in the Old Testament. It's a prophecy of the salvation that would one day come. You see, they were getting saved in the Old Testament in a different way than we do today. That's not heresy. It's called rightly dividing Scripture. There was no Jesus Christ to believe in back in the Old Testament. There were prophecies that that perfect sacrifice would come one day, but there were no Old Testament references to Jesus Christ dying on a cross, openly and saying, it's the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ as the payment for your sins. That wasn't there. So these people that tell you that they were saved by looking forward to the cross, they were lying to you. And we're going to see, especially about that later on, when Jesus is actually physically present on the earth. We're going to see what happened. Next, go to Psalm 34, verse 20. It says here, He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Now, if you read the story of Jesus dying on the cross, they go to the two thieves and they break their legs so that they, can, they can't hold themselves up anymore. They break their legs and, and they go down and, and it suffocates them, essentially. But they come to Jesus, and he's already dead, so they say, well, don't break his bones. Jesus, again, fulfilled this prophecy right here in the Old Testament. He fulfilled it. 
But this isn't the plan of salvation for an Old Testament Jew. Isaiah 53, the infamous Isaiah 53. I know a lot of Orthodox Jews try to stay away from this chapter because it clearly was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 12. We're going to read the whole chapter. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. These things that you see, these weird paintings of this long-haired hippie guy that's a pretty boy and whatever, that's not Jesus Christ. Okay, that's an artist rendition, mostly from the Catholics. Okay. Verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Very true if you read the account of Jesus Christ in the four Gospels. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Not only was Jesus crucified on the cross, he actually was beaten before being crucified. And, you know, you study the thing out, most people died from that, that type of beating, that scourging. I mean, when they're taking a whip that has sharp pieces of metal and, and bone and whatever else on it, and they're taking that thing across your back, it's ripping chunks of flesh off. Okay? It's going down into the muscle and tearing like that. And why was that? Why did that happen? Because of our sins? Yes, Jesus Christ did suffer and pay for the sins of man. Verse 6, All we like sheep... Remember to see the image of sheep there throughout the Bible? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus Christ in other words, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. If you read the, the different accounts and things there, there were times Jesus, you know, answered. There were other times that he just was quiet. And they're going, aren't you answering anything? You know, why don't you answer anything? See, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? Jesus didn't have children. And he wasn't married either. For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Who's writing here? Isaiah. Who were his people? You say, the spiritual Jews, Bible-believing Christians. Wrong. Now, the my people there in context is the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. Jesus came as the king of the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. He died for the Jews. Mm-hmm. Verse 9, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. You read about that in uh, the Gospels there. He was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But it says there that in the book of Hebrews that there was no guile in his mouth. Okay, Jesus did not use profanity. He, did not, um, he was not a, a, a man that ever said anything wrong. Verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Praise the Lord that he did that. <laughs> I wouldn't be saved, I wouldn't be on my way to heaven if he hadn't died for the transgressors. I'm a transgressor. And a lot of people don't get saved because they don't want to admit to being a transgressor. 
They don't want to come to a point of repentance. You see, Jesus said, I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You have to give up your self-righteousness. You have to stop saying, I think I can make it. I'm a good person. I, I'm, I'm not that bad and whatever else. You come to God as a sinner in a broken, contrite spirit and say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And then that payment is applied to your account. You put your faith in Jesus Christ and He saves you. And you don't have to worry about your good works. You know, if I've done enough good works to get into heaven, that isn't going to save you. If you are doing good works apart from Jesus Christ, if you've never been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, you're not saved. Just as simple as that. Next we're going to go to... Let's see where we're going to go. The New Testament. And now comes the main part of this study. Okay, And like I said, there are other prophecies in the Old Testament, many prophecies in the Old Testament. We're not going to go through them all because I'm just. this is the main part of the study that we're going to get into now. Once you get to the New Testament, this heretical teaching is that they were saved by looking forward to the cross. So then certainly the people that were right there when Jesus showed up, they should have totally understood the cross. They should have totally understood all these Old Testament prophecies and they should have been like, hey, Jesus is here. Look at all these prophecies that He's fulfilling. We're all saved by looking forward to the cross. Right? Let's see. Turn first to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11 verse 28. Matthew 11 verse 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Okay? So there again you see the thing, the concept of salvation being bought with a price. When you are bought with a price, you are what? You are a bond servant. That's why he says, take my yoke upon you. All right? So you're seeing that thing there that Jesus is basically telling these people what salvation is going to be. He's explaining some of that to them. And we're going to see if they understand it. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 through 40. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Well, shouldn't they have just believed because he had fulfilled all these Old Testament prophecies? And after all, they're looking forward to being saved by the cross, you know. And look at verse 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Huh. So Jesus Christ is saying, I'm going to die and be buried. And that's the only sign you people are going to get. Now, does that mean Jesus didn't give them signs up to that point? No, he had given them signs, but they were rejecting him as their Messiah, as their king. But wait a second. If they were being saved by looking forward to the cross, wouldn't they have accepted him as their Messiah? Why would they have rejected him as their Messiah if they were being saved by looking forward to the cross? They'd be looking forward to seeing their king showing up, to seeing their savior showing up. But they weren't. Hmm. You say, well, Ryan, that's just the lost ones. What about the, the, the ones that were saved there and stuff? We're going to see about that. Matthew chapter 16, verse 4. Here Jesus says again, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. So there he repeats what he said earlier. All right, jump down to verse 13. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. It says here, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Okay? Now here's a golden opportunity. They can say, you know, 
your Jesus Christ, and we're looking forward to you dying on the cross and you know all this other stuff. What goes on here? Verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, meaning Jesus Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That was not the foundation of the Catholic Church, okay? Like the Catholics try to teach. Peter was not the rock that the church is built upon. And you say, how do you know that? Let's keep reading. Verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now look at verse 21. <clears throat> From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Hmm. Just like he was talking about Jonas there being buried for three days and coming up. Now, surely these guys, I mean, they just, you know, Peter just said, you know, you're Jesus Christ. You know, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So obviously they know, you know, about the death, burial, and resurrection. I mean, they understand that because they're looking forward to that to be, to be saved, right? Verse 22, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, that th this shall not be unto thee. Huh? Why would he say that if he was looking forward to, you know, the cross to be saved? And verse 23 but he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Uh, I don't think Peter was the foundation there, the rock that the church is built upon, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay, um, The gates of hell just did prevail against Peter. Okay, But uh, it didn't prevail against Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the rock there that the church is built upon. The foundation, the sure foundation. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I believe it is, where it talks about the judgment seat of Christ. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Okay, Jesus Christ is the foundation that the church is built upon. Okay, so, but notice there, Peter says no to the thing of Jesus dying on the cross. Now, if they're looking forward to the cross to be saved, why would he say no to that? You see how the teaching falls apart when you actually start to study the scriptures and look up these scriptures? They were not saved by looking forward to the cross. They didn't understand it. The prophecies were there in the Old Testament, but you hit these Christians here, or not Christians, they weren't Christians until Acts chapter 11. They weren't called Christians until then, after the crucifixion, you know, burial, resurrection. But the point is, you look at these guys here, these disciples of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, they had no idea about Jesus dying on the cross. All right, and it gets worse as, as we go into it here. All right, um, now we're going to go to Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 17 through 35. It says here, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to, to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Okay, okay reading to verse 35. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. 
And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. What do we see there with the Passover? The Passover lamb had to have its blood spilled. A lamb without blemish. For what? To keep the death angel from killing the firstborn? Hmm. Verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. What are they doing? Same thing Peter did before. Jesus says, I'm going to die on the cross. Peter says, No, be it far from thee. That's not going to happen. Jesus turns and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou savorest not, savorest not the things that be of men, but that uh, or be of God, but those that be of men. What are they doing again? He's doing it again. Jesus says, It is written there. You know, he's saying, You're going to deny me. You're going to leave. You're going to run away. You know, it's written, it's prophesied. And these guys, these, these disciples were saying, no, 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 that's not true. If they're getting saved by looking forward to the cross, if they understand all these prophecies and everything else, if they were really truly students of the Bible and understood all these things and believed the prophecies, they'd say, yeah, we are going to leave you because it says it's written. Just a real big problem for these people that are, you know, non-dispensational. But look at verse 47. Go down to verse 47. There in the same chapter, it says here, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched, forth, stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Why on earth would Peter have taken his sword out? Why? Doesn't he understand? Doesn't he remember what Jesus Christ said to him before? I'm going to die on the cross. Hey, they're coming for me. It's, a, it's prophecy being fulfilled here. Scripture being fulfilled here. And Peter's like, no, no. And he wants to stop it again. Isn't that amazing? Three different times Peter tries to stop Scripture from being fulfilled. But he was saved by looking forward to the cross, right? Sure. If you can't read plain English, I guess you might believe that. Go to Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. It says here, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him the keepers did shake, and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. You get that? Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. So the angels are coming. They're going, Jesus said it, and now I'm saying it. All right. He rose from the dead. 
Go on over there. That's where you're going to meet him. Verse 8, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. So, now, what was the reaction of the disciples? Go down to verse 16. Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Again, people, if these guys are being saved by looking forward to the cross, even after the cross happens, even after Jesus is risen from the dead and he's standing there in the mountain and they come to see him, some of the disciples are still doubting. How can you possibly get this teaching that they were saved by looking forward to the cross? That's nonsense. Absolute, total nonsense. But let's continue here. We're going to go next to Mark 8. Mark chapter 8. Verse 31 through 33. We're going to see some of the same stuff repeated here. I'm just going to cover the different places where it shows up so people can't say, oh, you left this out or whatever. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Okay, so you see the other account there, another account of what Peter did there. All right, go next to Mark 9, verse 30. Mark 9, verse 30 through 32. It says here, And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Look at verse 32. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. Could it be any more clear than that? Bob, Brian, I know what you're saying, but I just believe that they were saved by looking forward to the cross. <laughs> Well, I can't help you, you know, if your skull is that thick that I'm not getting through there, you know, I feel bad for you. I mean, they understood it not. They didn't understand. Jesus is explaining how he's going to die on the cross, how he's going to be buried, how he's going to come back, rise up from the dead three days later. And they're going, I don't get it. And, and Jesus is like, you understand? They're like, yeah, yeah, you know, they're afraid to ask him. This teaching is absolutely ridiculous. This, they got saved by looking forward to the cross thing. Nonsense. Go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 14. It says here, Now when Jesus was risen early in the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that uh, had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had seen of her, uh, had been seen of her, believed not. Hmm. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Hmm. Interesting. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Boy, that teaching of they were saved by looking forward to the cross just really kind of starts to fall apart when you actually see what the Bible really says. Go next to Luke chapter 9. Luke 9 verse 22. Okay, it says here, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. So there again, Jesus is explaining this to them. All right, He's not just saying, you know, 
uh, just figure it out on your own or whatever. He, I mean, he's coming out and plainly saying, this is what's going to happen. You know, he's telling them what uh, the future is going to be. Look at verse 43. Jump down to verse 43 there in Luke chapter 9. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered, everyone at all things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, Let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them that they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. Jesus is speaking just absolutely plainly, and he says, Let this saying sink down into your ears, okay? You understand this? You know, they talk about something being burned into your mind that you never forget. Jesus is like saying, let it sink down into your ears, right? Listen to me. Do they understand? No, they don't. They still, even after, after Jesus is just plainly explaining, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried, I'm going to come up the third day. Do you understand? And they're going, I don't get it. And again, as I've been saying, how can you get the teaching that they're saved by looking forward to the cross? It's just not there. I mean, it's just, uh, man, tell you what. When you're non-dispensational, the Bible says, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what would the opposite of a good workman be? A poor workman. One that doesn't rightly divide the word of truth. They need to be ashamed. They mess the Bible up. They just destroy it. They're going all over the place trying to get doctrine for this and doctrine for that. They can't rightly divide the word of truth, so they make a mess of the Bible. And that's what non-dispensationalists do. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verse 29 through 30. It says here, And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, or given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Okay. So you see it there again. Next we're going to go to Luke 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Okay, it says here, Then he took them, or took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. This is stuff that they should have been raised with. This is stuff that they should have understood. That they, oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, there's things that we read in the Old Testament there. Isaiah chapter 53, hey, it's going to be fulfilled now. Verse 32, For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spit it on. And they shall scourge him, by his stripes were healed, remember, Isaiah 53, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Is there any mysteriousness to this? Is Jesus saying, now learn a parable here of the... No, he's speaking plainly. He's saying it's written in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament there, in the prophets. This is exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to be spit on. I'm going to be reviled. I'm going to be whipped. I'm going to be all, all this stuff crucified. And they're going to bury me. I'm going to come up at the third day. Verse 34, And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. I mean, if you're not convinced by now, I feel bad for you. Luke chapter 22. I'm probably going to get some diehard, you know, non-dispensationalist that's going to try and twist the scriptures and, you know, well, I, you didn't really talk about this or that or, uh, you know, yeah, whatever. Luke 22, verse 31 through 34. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Wait a second. Why would he say to Peter, when thou art converted? I thought Peter was a Christian here. No, they were called Christians first in Antioch. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Peter was not saved like we are today before the crucifixion. So, how could you say they were saved by looking forward to the cross? 
They didn't understand it, first of all. Secondly, Jesus Christ plainly says, you're not saved. When thou art converted. Now, you know, you can say, well, they were saved in the sense of the way that Old Testament saints should have been saved up at that point, up to the point where the Jesus died on the cross. I understand that. It's not that Jesus was like saying, you're on your way to hell, you're a hell-bound sinner, and blah, blah, blah. No, no. He's just saying, the system of salvation is going to change here, and you're going to have to be converted to being a Christian. No longer are you going to be an Old Testament Jew, Sabbath-keeping Old Testament law keeping and things, you're not going to have to be a Jew going down to the synagogue and the temple and, and the sacrifices and all that other stuff and animal sacrifices to atone for your sin. And that's not going to be anymore. You're going to be converted. All right. Verse 33 And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, but before that, that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Okay, so again there, Peter, Jesus just explained to him what's going to happen, you know, and he's saying, Peter's like, no, no, no you know, I'm not going to deny you. I won't deny you. And the Lord's like, I just told you we're going to. Yes, you will. Now go to Luke 24. 